Okay, let's get started. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, dear friends and colleagues. Uh, I'm Wafa El Sadr, I'm Global Director for ICAP at Columbia University, and it gives me great pleasure uh, to uh, introduce our speaker today and moderate this uh, webinar. So thank you for joining us today uh, for this uh, important webinar. Uh, this actually a webinar is one of a series, it's the first of a series that we are developing uh, that's part of a, of a uh, of the work of a new partnership that has uh, been developing between the Herbert Irving Comprehensive um, Cancer Center here at Columbia University and ICAP at Columbia University. And the purpose of this, uh, of this new initiative, this new collaboration is to advance training, research, education, and programs that are focused on cancer in global context, particularly in low and middle income countries. So this is a very important initiative that we're very excited about and, uh, and uh, we are uh, equally excited and thrilled that we have as our inaugural speaker today, uh, Dr. Satish Gopal. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Uh, Gopal and then we'll, um, I'll hand it over to him. So Dr. Gopal uh, was appointed as director of the Center for uh, Global Health at the National Cancer Institute in February, 2020, uh, right at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic actually. And in this new role, in his role, he oversees the development of initiatives and collaborations with other NCI divisions, uh, as well as with NCI designated cancer centers. Uh, one of them is of course here at Columbia University and also countries to support cancer research and cancer research networks and promote cancer control uh, planning and build capacity in low and middle income countries. These are issues that we're all uh, very uh, passionate about and uh, eager to engage with. Previously, he um, served as, uh, he was um, previous to joining the NCI, he was the cancer program director uh, at the University of North Carolina in their project, uh, the project that uh, uh, was a collaboration, is a collaboration between UNC and uh, Malawi and uh, in terms of uh, addressing cancer related issues. And this project was in collaboration as well with the Malawi Ministry of Health. For today, after, uh, please, as you listen to Dr. Gopal, please put your questions um, in the chat box. Uh, you can put your questions anytime during the presentation. And at the end of his presentation, we'll have the opportunity to uh, have a discussion and to have Dr. Gopal answer uh, your uh, questions as well. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Gopal and welcome. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Wafa. Let me bring my slides up. So I will assume that you can see and hear okay. Yes. Unless we're here otherwise. Um, so thanks again. It's really um, an honor to, I think, have the opportunity to speak with you all today at the um, inaugural session marking the beginning of this really important new initiative. Um, as Wafa mentioned, um, I'm Satish Gopal and I uh, direct the Center for Global Health at the National Cancer Institute and have been in that role since February of last year, just before COVID. Um, so I was thinking a little bit about um, this talk a couple of weeks ago uh, and happened to come across this paper in science and thought it might be a good place to start. So um, in this uh, science article from a couple of weeks ago, uh, it was an interview with Dr. Tedros, who, uh, of course, is the Director General of the WHO. And in it, he spoke about his exasperation uh, with respect to vaccine inequity. So this is a photo of Dr. Tedros receiving his vaccine on May 12th and, uh, and symbolic protest waiting until African health workers uh, were eligible to receive the COVID vaccine, although, of course, he would have had access to it much earlier. Uh, and in this article, he speaks about vaccine inequity, which he labels vaccine apartheid, a catastrophic moral failure that has led to a two-track pandemic. Um, he describes having seen such moral failure previously uh, as antiretroviral therapy became available in high-income countries, but took many years to be scaled up in low- and middle-income countries where most of the global HIV burden was concentrated. Uh, and in the interview, during the question and answer portion, um, the interviewer actually quoted an excerpt from an article from 10 years ago, from 2011, that Dr. Tedros had actually forgotten. 
Uh, and the interviewer quoted from this article saying that advocacy, urgency, a sense of optimism that it could be done and political commitment matched by adequate resources provided the foundation for HIV scale up. Um, Dr. Tedros forgot that he had written this 10 years ago in 2011 and forgot perhaps that he had written it together with Kevin DeCock and Wafa El Sadr. Um, and so I, of course, found this really interesting, given that I was due to give this talk a couple of weeks later and actually pull the original article. Um, so this is a paper from 2011 from JADES. Um, 2011 happens to be the same year that the Center for Global Health at the National Cancer Institute was established by our then director at the time, Harold Barmas. And the paper really talks about game changers. Why did the scale up of HIV treatment work despite weak health systems? Uh, and I'm just have included an excerpt here from the concluding paragraph of this paper, which uh, I've tried to use as a kind of animating um, uh, guide for this talk. And what they write is that game changers are irreversible. There is no going back to the situation before the scale up of HIV programs. Policymakers and implementers would do well to study the history of HIV scale up for guidance and encouragement in the face of the broader global health agenda that we need to address commitment, resources, technical expertise, partnerships. The list of ingredients for success is long, but prominent are principled pragmatism, optimism, and reliance on science and evidence to guide the way. So of course, within this broader global health agenda is cancer, and that's the topic of this new initiative that you all have launched. Um, and of course, the topic that we are to speak about today. So first, um, low and middle income countries are projected to have 69% of global cancer burden by 2040. Uh, and that's shown here. Um, and you can see that the proportional increase from in 2040 from current burden in 2020 will be largest in the lowest income countries, which will see, or see a near doubling in cancer deaths between 2020 and 2040. Um, and so just to, again, put this in context a little bit, in 2020, what this equated to was approximately 27,000 global cancer deaths per day. Um, and if you look at the current COVID deaths per day estimate globally, this is actually a figure that I drew from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation this morning, it's approximately 16,000 global COVID deaths per day. So of course, this isn't to say that COVID is, um, that we should ignore COVID, I mean, arguably, it'll be impossible to address global cancer without addressing COVID. However, I do wanna make the point that um, global cancer is an enormous problem and it's a slow burning fire that is expanding over years and decades rather than over weeks and months as COVID is. And, and um, I think that's important for us to recognize. The other thing is the COVID and cancer, as I mentioned, are obviously interrelated. And so um, this is a, um, a paper from uh, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, or IARC, um, in which they surveyed uh, staff across multiple countries who were involved in national cancer control efforts to get a sense for how severely disrupted cancer services were. And this was as of September 2020, which is the time that the survey was done. And the countries are basically arrayed from lowest income countries on the left to higher income countries on the right, although all are LMICs. And you can see in general that services tend to be better preserved in high income countries, and that in general treatment services tend to be better preserved than testing and diagnostic services. Uh, I would want to point out that although, although Cote d'Ivoire, Rwanda, and Cameroon were among the lowest income countries surveyed in this uh, paper by IARC colleagues, um, at that time, these countries did not have a significant COVID caseload, and so that may be part of the reason why services were relatively um, preserved in those countries at the time that the survey was done in September. Um, so that was a survey done of national cancer control staff. Um, this is now um, specific effects on cancer services at the individual patient level. And I think some of the best data with respect to the effects that COVID is having are from India. So this is data from the National Cancer Grid, which is a network of cancer centers across India. Um, and you can see that this is now a year ago in, in May of 2020, that um, in terms of new patient registrations, outpatient clinic visits, hospital admissions, major surgeries, minor surgeries, there's really steep reductions 
in the um, volume of all of these cancer related services, again, across cancer centers participating in the national cancer grid in India compared with the same time period in 2019. And I'll point out that both with the previous paper and with this paper, that although these data were quite recently published, they're of course already out of date. Uh, and so for example, this paper in India does not reflect the much more recent tragic kind of overwhelming COVID way that uh, India succumbed to over the last couple of months. Uh, and so generating real-time data about the impacts that COVID is having on cancer services um, has been hard even in high income countries. And I think we're um, always kind of behind the eight ball really in LMICs where generating these types of data in real time is really difficult given the baseline limitations in, in cancer health um, systems. I do wanna point out that um, this year, is it, as I mentioned, is the 10th anniversary of the creation of a Center for Global Health at the NCI. And in honor of that, we've initiated a new Global Cancer Research and Control Seminar Series. Our next speaker on July 13th is actually Dr. C.S. Pramesh, who directs Tata Memorial Hospital and was the leader who was responsible largely for convening this national cancer grid in India, including its recent COVID mitigation efforts across this network. So he'll be speaking about this, including experience during the much more recent and more devastating India COVID surge. So for those of you who are interested, this, these talks are open to the public and I invite you to visit our website and register if you wanna hear um, Dr. Pramesh's talk, which I'm sure will be outstanding. The other thing I always like to try to remind people is that um, COVID is superimposed really on a history of global cancer success, failure and inequity. And I often illustrate that um, using Burkitt lymphoma as an example primarily because much of my own work before, before coming to the NCI was focused on lymphoid malignancies, uh, clinical translational studies of lymphoid malignancies in Sub-Saharan Africa. And just to illustrate this briefly, Dennis Burkett was an Irish surgeon who discovered a new human tumor, Burkett lymphoma, among children in Uganda in 1958. And these are children who were photographed and pictured as individual figures in Dennis Burkett's original description in the British Journal of Surgery. Several years later, um, tumor specimens from these children were sent to London and electron microscopy revealed viral particles, which ended up being named Epstein-Barr virus. And so this was discovered as the first human oncogenic virus and reported in The Lancet in 1964. Subsequently, there were efforts to treat this tumor using chemotherapy, and in particular, combining several different chemotherapy drugs together, uh, and the discovery that multi-agent chemotherapy could be an effective treatment mode for human cancer. And so this is John Ziegler, who was a senior investigator in the pediatric oncology branch at the NCI, who spent a lot of time living and working in Uganda, trying to learn from the African experience and then apply that to patients with Burkitt lymphoma in the United States. And so this is the New England Journal of Medicine paper in which he does just that, describes equivalent treatment experiences in the United States when applying regimens that had been developed in Uganda. Subsequently, uh, Dr. Ricardo Dalla Favra, while he was at the NCI, isolated the CMYK oncogene, uh, who of course is now at your own cancer center. This more recently has been followed by comprehensive molecular profiling to really understand the tumor biology of the EBV positive and EBV negative variants of Burkitt lymphoma. This is work done uh, again at the NCI in the lymphoid malignancies branch, which where I now have an adjunct appointment by Lou Stout and others. And all of those uh, biologic insights have allowed therapeutic optimization such that in clinical trials in um, high income countries, there are really remarkable patient outcomes across uh, you know, a broad swath of children, adolescents and young adults um, being treated with contemporary regimens in the United States and other high income countries. However, I often say that you know, what we have failed to do is actually translate a bro broadly deployable curative solution back to the very children who initiated uh, these decades of scientific progress. And I say that because during the decade that I lived and worked as an oncologist in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, I routinely saw children who presented just as they did in the 1950s and 1960s and who had similar patient outcomes. Um, and I often say that I think this is morally objectionable, a moral failure, similar to the language that uh, Dr. Tedros used in describing 
COVID vaccine inequity, um, which I alluded to at the beginning of this talk, but I also think it's scientifically objectionable because to me, I think we failed to um, complete what is a natural next step in this line of inquiry. That is, can we use all of these insights, biologic insights that we've learned and knowledge about this tumor's therapeutic vulnerabilities to again, deliver a solution that would be broadly deployable for patients worldwide. So with that, I wanna talk a little bit about our attempts to address cancer in LMICs. And again, borrowing from Wafa's paper with Dr. Tedros and Dr. Dukak with principled pragmatism, optim optimism, and reliance on science and evidence. And I'm gonna talk briefly about um, work that we did in Malawi uh, before I came to the NCI. I don't wanna bore you with this by going through it too extensively, but I do think it will um, illustrate some important intersections between HIV and cancer. And it may also be, this is also work that we're trying to continue now, um, even since I've joined the NCI. And I think in large respect, what we were trying to do is similar to what I think you all are trying to do with this important new initiative, which is bring a very strong and successful global HIV program together with a strong and successful cancer center to um, realize synergies um, of these two organizations collaborating together in service of global cancer research and control. And I essentially directed that effort um, before being recruited to the NCI last year. And so I thought, going through that at least briefly would be instructive. So again, before coming to the NCI last year, I lived and worked in Malawi. Malawi is a small country in uh, southeastern Africa, as many of you will know. It has approximately 18 million people. It's largely a rural population with 16% living in urban areas. Life expectancy is 61 years. Gross national income per capita, 340. US dollars, human development index rank is 173 out of 187 countries ranked, HIV prevalence was 9%, progress towards the 90-90-90 targets uh, for UN AIDS are 90% tested, 78% treated, 69% suppressed. And during the time that I was living and working there, there was I was the only medical oncologist in, the country, in this country of 18 million people. There were two clinical oncologists, which is a training program that some of you will be familiar with who've lived and worked in Sub-Saharan Africa. There were two pediatric oncologists, no surgical oncologists, four pathologists, no radiotherapy, and uh, Malawi has an annual health expenditure per capita of approximately 35 US dollars. So needless to say, trying to deliver cancer care under these circumstances is extremely different from the United States or certainly the NCI where I currently work. And so what I wanted to go through briefly is just, you know, how we tried to in some ways replicate, I think, the um, HIV movement uh, uh, and learn lessons from the way that HIV scale up had proceeded. Um, again, alluding back to this article by Wafa and uh, Dr. Tedros and Kevin DeCock that I uh, mentioned at the beginning, and, and, you know, how we sought to assemble this long list of ingredients that they also alluded to in how you make programs like this successful. So one is, of, the first thing is, of course, you have to build and support critical infrastructure. Just as an example, it was very clear to us early on that um, diagnostic pathology was going to be a foundation for any um, cancer research or care delivery um, program. And so we outfitted a lab, built and outfitted a lab, introduced immunohistochemistry, introduced some molecular diagnostics, introduced telepathology. So we would have a weekly conference between clinicians and pathologists in Malawi and the United States. Um, I now participate in a very similar conference uh, with the lymphoid malignancies branch at the NCI, which I'm often struck is qualitatively very similar to the conference that we were running in Malawi. Um, and then, you know, from there, you start to try to simply understand clinical presentations and outcomes among patients um, under local conditions. So again, this is our attempts to do that with diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which is the most common non-Hodgkin lymphoma worldwide. Um, and again, for those of you who've worked in HIV, you will appreciate that this sounds trivial, but it really isn't trivial. Really understanding what happens longitudinally to patients in African settings where patients are traveling great distances, where loss to follow up is a big issue. Um, that is not in any way a trivial undertaking, but is really essential and, found, and foundational to the enterprise. Um, and so what we learned was that, you know, outcomes were not surprisingly, not as good as in high income countries, but many patients were cured. Um, outcomes did not seem to depend um, significantly on HIV status, but were largely driven by 
prognostic features associated with the lymphoma. So this is um, shown using a variety of prognostic indices that are um, validated for lymphoma, that it was really lymphoma prognostic features rather than HIV status that was driving patient outcomes. And then we began to think, you know, how can we improve our risk stratification and our response assessment? One thing that we tried to take advantage of was the existing HIV infrastructure. So there were already HIV RNA instruments in place to measure viral loads in support of the UNAIDS 90-90-90 targets that I alluded to already. Um, and so we thought, hey, well, we can use these same instruments to measure plasma EBV. And plasma EBV is a very effective circulating tumor biomarker for EBV-related malignancies like pediatric Burkitt lymphoma. Again, I mentioned already that EBV was actually discovered in Ugandan tumor specimens from children with Burkitt lymphoma. And so we can use this uh, existing instruments and a new assay on these existing instruments to really understand how patients are responding. Um, this had already been done with some great success for screening, risk stratification, and response assessment, for example, in nasopharyngeal carcinoma to, in Asian countries, and we thought we could do something quite similar in Malawi. And so this is showing plasma EBV, which for children with Burkitt lymphoma is very high at baseline, declines throughout treatment, and typically increases at the time of relapse. <clears throat> and again, what you can see here is that um, the baseline plasma EBV level has a strong prognostic association, in addition to having a strong prognostic association when it's persistently detectable at the midpoint of treatment. So again, in a setting where you don't have advanced imaging, where you may not have all of the um, prognostic and response assessment technologies that are available to you typically in a US setting, we thought this is a, a simple measurement that can be done on an existing instrument using peripheral blood that we think really had some utility for both pediatric Burkitt lymphoma, for Hodgkin lymphoma, which is another EBV associated lymphoproliferative disorder. Um, we also tried to avail opportunities to better understand biology. Um, so I, again, now um, in, uh, sit in the lymphoid malignancies branch at NCI where Lou Stout and others have really done seminal studies in defining diffuse large B-cell lymphoma um, uh, biology and uh, elucidating molecular subtypes within what otherwise looks like a histologically uniform entity that have real clinical importance. Um, those types of studies have never really been done for HIV. And I've spoken with, this, uh, about, with Lou about this recently because it's difficult in the US to find enough HIV positive patient samples. And when you try to compare any tumor type, for example, diffuse large B cell lymphoma between HIV positive and HIV negative individuals, there's other confounders. So the HIV positive individuals typically are 20 years younger and with a very different socio-behavioral profile, risk profile than HIV negative individuals with the same tumor type. And in an African context where you have a generalized epidemic, um, a lot of those problems are easier. And so you can really understand HIV effects on tumor biology within a, within a specific cancer type. And so this is, again, without going through this in a lot of detail, this is just one illustration of our attempts to do that for diffuse large B cell lymphoma, where we found that by gene expression profiling, um, that transcriptome clustering really did define two discrete clusters that were different and highly associated with HIV status. Um, with um, gene set enrichment analysis, this really um, seem to implicate specific pathways that may, again, may have um, therapeutic implications. Um, and then even within the HIV infected population, I think all, all of you who work in HIV will appreciate that, um, you know, often non-HIV providers think of HIV as a uniform entity, but um, for it's very different if people are on antiretroviral therapy and have been for a long time or have not been on antiretroviral therapy and that, Again, working in Malawi really helped us to try to start to understand this, how um, there may be a continuum of biology across the spectrum of HIV, depending on the immunologic and virologic context in which the tumor is occurring. And so again, without belaboring this, one can see that um, there is this continuum of um, micro tumor microenvironmental features um, based on whether the patient is HIV negative, whether they're HIV positive on antiretroviral therapy or HIV positive without being on antiretroviral therapy. And again, I consider all of this really just preliminary studies to start to try to get at some of these issues, specifically in the HIV context that have been quite 
difficult to do the appropriate studies in the US or other high income countries. And then we sought to you know, use these insights to really understand, um, to improve treatment and outcomes. Here are just a couple of examples. Once we understood that, for example, for adolescents and young adults with Perkin lymphoma, that outcomes were quite poor with um, existing therapy and that um, most uh, deaths were occurring because of Burkitt lymphoma progression rather than treatment related toxicity. This allowed us to incrementally intensify treatment and res resulting in better outcomes. This here is for diffuse large B cell lymphoma, a paper that we recently published where we applied the Indian biosimilar rituximab to patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Again, very similar to what was done with early ART demonstrations in Sub-Saharan Africa, that is attempting to apply the international standard of care in a, a Sub-Saharan African context for the first time and demonstrate that this could be safe and effective even under um, local programmatic conditions resulting in a two-year overall survival for these patients of 55% which is among, I think, the best reported for this patient population, which otherwise had very adverse disease characteristics. Um, we also tried to pay attention and recognize and address emerging issues as these arose. Um, again, I, I think this is very similar with the way HIV scale-up programs have had to proceed. Um, one such issue is multicentric Castleman disease. So this is a polyclonal uh, lymphoproliferative disorder caused by KSHV, typically in the context of HIV. This has really not been described in Sub-Saharan Africa, although KS is very widely appreciated as an extremely common tumor in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but as our program proceeded, we rapidly you know, began to identify cases and then develop um, a, a real cohort of patients. And one of the things that we were struck by is that um, MCD for in our um, uh, setting in Malawi really seemed to be occurring primarily in patients who were on antiretroviral therapy for very long periods with relatively good immune status. So um, we really think that this is probably an emerging comorbidity that um, was relatively infrequently seen before ART scale-up um, happened. But now that ART scale-up is proceeding, this is likely a condition that we will see more of. And so the ability to recognize and manage it under local conditions, I think was really important for us to develop in Malawi. And then finally, um, you know, as with HIV scale up, um, making an investment case to donors and, and, and the um, development community more broadly. And so again, we've tried to do that. This is again, drawing specifically on an example related to lymphoid malignancies in Malawi, but evaluating the cost effectiveness of, for example, CHOP, versus no chemotherapy or RCHOP versus CHOP. And in general, these have very favorable cost effectiveness metrics that are quite comparable to other widely accepted public health interventions in Sub-Saharan Africa, like HIV treatment or prevention. And um, you know, trying to provide these data to ministries and policymakers and funders and development um, assistance uh, groups uh, to try to make a broader investment case that cancer treatment investments can really be worthwhile, even in countries that have annual health expenditures per capita uh, that are quite low as Malawi does. We tried to promote young investigators and a scientific culture. So this is a meeting focused on HIV associated malignancies that we um, held with NCI support um, several years ago, bringing together um, senior and junior investigators working in this specific topical area from across Sub-Saharan African countries and from the US um, and often heard from you know, deans of the Malawi College of Medicine, that it was really exciting for them to see these opportunities for their young people and that many of their most talented young people were becoming interested in cancer as a research career, which had not previously really been an avenue that had been widely available to them. Um, so I'm going to shift now and talk from the NCI perspective. So I wanted to just run through a little bit of Malawi background, um, again, partially because I think this is an HIV and cancer audience, partly because I think we sought to do something similar to what you all are trying to do in bringing um, your cancer center and ICAP together. Um, and also partly because I think a lot of the work that I was doing before are things that we are really trying to continue now. Um, at the NCI. And again, you know, I've just illustrated here that I'm largely doing the same things um, from a slightly different geographic position on the globe and perhaps with a slightly different resource level than was available to me in Malawi. Um, so this is the NCI. 
Um, it was established in 1937 and really in its current form by the National Cancer Act of 1971. Uh, and I will point out that we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Act um, this year. And you all are, may have seen uh, many of the promotions that the NCI is doing together with the larger cancer research community to commemorate how important that landmark legislation has been in driving progress. Um, our FY21 annual budget is 6.56 billion. This is sort of our organizational structure. I've tried to just illustrate uh, that this is us here at the Center for Global Health. We are one part of a big complex organization. We're one of the younger parts of the NCI having been established by Harold Barmas 10 years ago. And global activity at the NCI actually exists throughout the organization and preceded the creation of a Center for Global Health. But I do like to point out that we are the only part of the NCI that has a primary focus on global health. Our interest is primarily in low and middle income countries. We think about global health from a, a disease agnostic and discipline agnostic point of view, which I think is a, um, is a real opportunity, although also presents challenges. That is, you know, we're, we don't focus on a specific disease and then therefore go to the part of the world where that disease happens to be most common. We really think about how can the NCI be most impactful globally? And in doing that, we have our own programs which are largely focused on LMICs and then also have the opportunity to collaborate and, um, and support activity that's ongoing across the NCI. So this is the NCI extramural global portfolio and we've just complete, we're now in fiscal year 2021. So we have analyzed data through the last year, 2020. Um, and so you'll see here that approximately 13% of the extramural global portfolio at the NCI has an international component. A very small percentage of that is direct international awards. Um, and then a larger portion is awards to US institutions that then have a foreign component. Um, this is showing that there's reasonable distribution across these um, common scientific code areas spanning from biology to cancer control, um, there's pretty good coverage across a range of cancer sites. And then this is showing the trends over the last decade, which show, uh, in general, a gradual increase, I think, in the overall um, international proportion of the NCI port extramural portfolio that has an international component. The, the um, direct international award awards has remained quite small. And again, this is something that we're specifically attending to now at the Center for Global Health and hope to increase. Um, but there has been this gradual increase, in, including a fairly substantial increase, um, even within the last two years that we have analyzed. Um, and this is showing the regional and income level distribution. So again, all world regions represented. Um, there is, most of the activity is in high income countries, but you know, and again, most of our focus at the Center for Global Health is in LMICs. This is showing the LMIC specifically laid out by country. You can see the frequency of specific countries amongst these LMIC awards, including both the foreign component awards and the direct awards to um, institutions that are in uh, LMICs. And then this is the intramural global portfolio. So we have two intramural divisions at the NCI. One is the Center for Cancer Research. Um, what is the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics? Again, my adjunct investigator appointment is in CCR. Um, similar to the extramural portfolio, there are projects, a range of projects, international projects um, involving a number of, of investigators across both intramural divisions. There's a um, wide regional distribution of these really spanning all world regions. Um, the common scientific codes for these projects are largely concentrated in biology, etiology, and treatment, which is where the interests of these two um, intramural divisions tends to lie. Uh, and again, you can see a variety of cancer sites represented in the intramural portfolio of the NCI. So I want to talk now a little bit about us. That, that was kind of an overview of the NCI portfolio overall. I want to talk a little bit about our activities at the Center for Global Health more specifically. We have recently um, developed over the last year and articulated a, a strategic plan for the next five years. This is publicly available at our website. So for those of you who may be interested, I encourage you to look for it there and give us feedback um, about um, your thoughts. Our goals, uh, again, are so we are focused on low and middle income countries uh, in terms of our own programmatic portfolio at the Center for Global Health. 
And this is oriented really around four primary goals. So research and particularly research that is addressing key scientific issues in global cancer control and are leveraging unique or unusual scientific opportunities that are afforded by global collaboration. We are focused on research trainings that enables equitable and impactful global scientific collaboration. We are focused on dissemination to promote the integration of current scientific knowledge into global cancer control policies and practice and then partnerships. So we play a representational function for the NCI and really promote its engagement with key partners in global cancer research and control. And I'll just try to highlight illustrations of some of our activity in each of these four goal areas over the subsequent slides. So with respect to research, you will see this in our strategic plan, but I'm really looking at the portfolio of activities that we've developed over our first decade and the areas where we see potential for real impact and particular need going forward. Um, these are the areas where a lot of our interest is, is um, concentrated at the Center for Global Health. So we're very interested in accelerating technology development for global cancer control and have a number of programs focused on um, aspects of that theme. We're very interested in accelerating global cancer implementation science and again have a number of programs focused on that theme. We're interested in understanding and addressing global cancer health disparities increasing support for cancer clinical trials in LMICs, which is a particular area that is very, has very little representation in the um, fairly large clinical trial portfolio of the NCI currently, and that's an area that we're thinking a lot about how we might specifically address that. Um, and then finally, increasing our understanding of cancer etiology and biology through global collaboration. So again, without trying to be exhaustive, which I think time doesn't really allow today because I am really interested in your questions and comments, I, I really just wanted to highlight a few illustrations to give you a sense of the type of things that we're working on. So I already mentioned um, technology development for global cancer control as a key theme in our own research portfolio at the NCI Center for Global Health. So one example of that is the Affordable Cancer Technology Program, which we have run for several years and have recently reissued. Um, one of the outcomes of that program that we're really excited about has been the acceleration of portable thermocoagulator devices to ablate cervical precancer. So as you all will be familiar with, um, the WHO has articulated a very ambitious elimination goal for cervical cancer, which really um, sort of follows from the 90-90-90 targets of UNAIDS, except that these are 90-70-90 targets. So 90% of school-aged girls vaccinated against human papillomavirus, 70% of women screened with an HPV test, and 90% of women with um, cervical cancer or precancer receiving treatment. Um, and the NCI has made really seminal contributions, I would say, to each of these steps. Uh, I'm going to focus now specifically on this last step where uh, previously the um, treatment for cervical precancer was largely uh, liquid nitrogen uh, cryotherapy. And as you all will be very familiar with, that's a very diff logistically difficult solution to um, implement, especially in rural sub-Saharan Africa, you know, maintaining the uh, continuous supply of these um, bulky, uh, difficult to procure canisters is really challenging. And so one of the things that has emerged is these newer technologies, often battery powered, often handheld, um, these portable thermocoagulator devices, uh, again, which have large, uh, to some extent, been accelerated um, through support provided by the Affordable Cancer Technologies Program. And so a couple of our grantees have worked to validate these devices, provided those data to the WHO. And again, because this um, issue was in such need of um, a, a better solution, these data were very rapidly taken up into the WHO guidelines. Um, there's a lot of work in this area that continues, including um, uh, evaluations in HIV-infected populations, second-generation devices that may be more effective, but again, contributing to this sort of uh, progress on behalf of cancer patients worldwide is something that we're really excited about. Another example is household air pollution. So um, we at the NCI and coordinated through our Center for Global Health are um, uh, providing support for a large multi-country country randomized clinical trial, evaluating a clean cook stove intervention among pregnant women to evaluate effects on infant growth and pneumonia. And this is being supported by a number of different NIH institutes 
We are, co again, coordinating um, support from the NCI. The, the, there's support from other funders, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And this is preliminary data from the Indian trial sites showing that there were um, significant reductions, health relevant reductions in fine particular matter after the intervention. Um, and we, we are specifically supporting, uh, although the primary outcomes are focused on infant growth and pneumonia, we are supporting uh, assessments of cancer associated biomarkers to evaluate how this cl clean cook stove intervention may be associated with reductions in cancer risk. Research training I mentioned is another really important goal area for us. We have a number of programs here. One is a new D43 program to strengthen institutional capacity to conduct global cancer research. I'll speak about that a little bit at the end. We also work with the Fogarty International Center to provide a, to support a couple of different career development award mechanisms for um, early career global cancer investigators, both from the US and from LMICs. We have some shorter, um, experiential learning uh, opportunities, both for the extramural community and the intramural community. Um, one example of an outcome of this short-term scientist exchange program is shown at Wright, which is um, facilitating collaboration between Indian investigators and investigators in the NCI Intramural Center for Cancer Research, which um, supported uh, cellular ther therapy collaborations to make these um, novel immunotherapy platforms available to patients in India. Um, within our dissemination goal area and our interest in promoting science-based uh, global cancer control, there are a few things that I thought were worth mentioning. One is the International Cancer Control Partnership, which I'll speak about on the next slide. Um, this is a group that has really been focused on helping support countries um, in the implementation of their national cancer control plans. Shown here is an article from this group um, during the last year, really emphasizing the importance of a continued um, focus on cancer control even during COVID. Uh, we also coordinate NCI participation in the International Cancer Screening Network. Um, the NIH hosts two collaborating center agreements with the WHO. One of these is held by NIAID. The other one is held by NCI and is coordinated through our center. Again, in the interest of helping provide scientific expertise as is needed by WHO as they formulate their cancer-related programs and policies. And then finally, that annual symposium on global cancer research, which is shown at bottom right. This is a meeting that we organized together with ASCO, AACR, um, cancer centers, a consortium of universities for global health. It's the longest running satellite meeting to the CUGH meeting. Um, it's also, we think, one of the largest and longest running scientific meetings specifically focused on global cancer research. Um, we, of course, held this virtually um, several months ago, had, uh, you know, I think a, a wide number of attendees from 70 countries, a really diverse speaker lineup. Um, and so we're really excited that this has become a really important scientific venue for moving the field forward and would invite those of you who haven't participated in this meeting previously to consider attending next spring. Um, so this is the International Cancer Control Partnership. This is a meeting that we support. This is a group that we support and coordinate from the NCI Center for Global Health that includes uh, really multiple partners. And really the idea here is that as countries are ready to develop, implement and evaluate um, evidence-based national cancer control plans is to assemble a group of stakeholders that can really provide the kind of support that these countries need. Um, this has been, I think, a really exciting um, initiative to move forward. I think countries are finding this kind of support to be really fa um, fabulous and, and valuable as they're implementing their national cancer control plans. And we're, um, uh, you know, really excited. And, and it's, I think, been particularly important during COVID to maintain this sort of focus on national cancer control planning at the individual country level. And then just a few things to say about partnership before I try to wrap up and hopefully leave some time for questions and, and, and conversation. Um, so one which I'll speak about is the International Cancer Research Partnership. I thought that would be a valuable group for you all to be familiar with. Our work with the cancer centers, which is also something that I think you all should be familiar with. Um, and then the other thing that we do at our center is really help facilitate international agreements and collaboration for NCI as an institute. And at right, I've just shown one example of this, which is the All Ireland Cancer Consortium, which is a um, is a is an agreement between the NCI and 
um, cancer related institutions in Northern Ireland and Ireland that were that actually dates back to the Good Friday Accords in the late 1990s. This agreement was actually recently renewed and you can see that following this agreement there's been a marked increase in scientific productive productivity on the island of Ireland um, following this agreement. This is the International Cancer Research Partnership, which I thought was a useful um, group for you all to be familiar with. What we have sought to do in at the NCI in founding this organization in 2000 is to try to bring together cancer research funders around the world to harmonize their data and, and, and compile it together. So there's a good sense of what's being funded, where the gaps are, et cetera. And we estimate that this now covers approximately 60% of cancer research funding internationally. There's a very active effort now to recruit additional funders to this group, including funders in LMICs so that um, to make this data more valuable and to make it more representative of cancer research funding around the world. I wanted to speak briefly about the NCI designated cancer centers global oncology survey. So another thing that we've really sought to do at the NCI Center for Global Health really over the last decade is to work with the cancer centers to document and incentivize the growth of global oncology at the cancer centers. Um, and one of the ways that we've done that is through a survey. So the last survey was conducted a couple of years ago. At that time, there were 70 NCI designated cancer centers, nearly all of which responded. And you know, it's been really exciting and interesting to see the growth of global oncology at the cancer centers. So for example, in the most recent survey round, approximately half of cancer centers had a formal global oncology program. And there's really a remarkable number of projects in a, in a huge number of countries when you take the, survey the activity across the cancer centers broadly. One of the things that we were struck by in the most recent cancer center survey round is that even though there's been this proliferation of uh, global oncology activities at cancer centers, that this was not really accompanied by dedicated global cancer research training. And we thought that was really a, a gap that we could help address. Um, and that it's difficult to build a real discipline and community um, without having dedicated training. You know, this is why cancer centers have T32 grants in immunology or health services research. We really thought that there needed to be something comparable for global oncology. And that was really the rationale for developing our D43 program. That's a grant mechanism that historically has resided at Fogarty, but we thought there's really a critical mass of uh, cancer center engagement, a critical mass of young investigators who would really benefit from the type of in stable institutional uh, cancer research training, global cancer research training that a D43 mechanism would allow. And that's why we've moved that program forward and are excited um, to, to have initiated that with a really overwhelming response, I would say, from the extramural community. So our survey of the Cancer Center, again, we've disseminated this quite widely. I encourage those of you who may not be familiar with these data to have a look. I, I actually had a chance to speak to the cancer center directors at their annual meeting uh, about these data a, a year ago. Many of them contacted me to speak about global oncology programs at their cancer centers. Specifically following that presentation, I think it was very warmly received. We're actually in the process now of piloting the next RET survey round, which includes a lot of um, questions about how COVID has impacted global oncology at the cancer centers. Um, we're continuing to work closely with the cancer centers to optimize global oncology data capture in a way that hopefully is informing our own CGH programs, as I mentioned, with the D43 program that we've recently initiated, as well as the broader global oncology community. And we've also, um, in this process, refined the guidance for the NCI designated cancer centers to report their global oncology activities in their cancer center support grants. Historically, that was something that wasn't included at all. And in recent years, we've managed to work with the Office of Cancer Centers at the NCI, as well as cancer centers themselves to ensure that cancer centers are able to report this and are getting credit um, when, when they're uh, you know, up for their renewal for all of the global oncology activity that many of them are conducting. I wanted to end just by saying a word about equity. And again, this harkens back a little bit to the vaccine inequity issue that um, Dr. Tedros spoke about that I alluded to at the beginning. I, I know this is something that you all are thinking about just as all institutions. Um, we are thinking about this a lot. We've um, initiated a new NCI equity and inclusion program that is really institute wide. Um, we presented about this at our recent virtual joint board meeting. 
um, at top is shown the structure of this program. Um, and, you know, inequity is really a problem that plagues, um, you know, the biomedical research workforce more broadly, and certainly the cancer research workforce. And this is true both at the extramural and the intramural levels. And so uh, just reflecting that, I've just excerpted a couple of slides that we showed at the joint board meetings a few weeks ago. One is the extramural portfolio. And you can see, for example, that Black or African-American investigators are extremely underrepresented relative to their population level proportion, both in the applicant pool and the awardee pool for NCI R01 funding. So there's um, inequities both in terms of applicants and then the success rate once, uh, patient, once investigators submit applications. This is true in the intramural program as well, where Black and Hispanic um, investigators are really underrepresented in the intramural scientific leadership. Uh, and again, for those of you who may be interested, I'd encourage you to go and watch this vir uh, virtual joint board meeting presentation where I think we detailed a lot of the um, plans and activities at the NCI to try to address some of these issues. One of the things that I have been thinking a lot about is the, ext the extent to which global health is connected to this larger equity agenda. And, and I think um, it is. I, I do think it's important to acknowledge that there are some specific you know, US issues that um, require organizational change and policy responses that may be specific to the United States or specific to um, US institutions. But I, I do like to kind of hearken, wanna hearken back to Malawi and um, make the point that within the group of young investigators that we had the opportunity to work with and you know, support their career development. Um, you know, this was a really diverse group with 50% of um, this group self-identifying as black or African-American. Um, this includes, for example, Tamiwe Tamoka, who is the first female pathologist in Malawi. He's now leading molecular breast cancer profiling studies. Um, this includes Lamek Chinula, who is a, a gynecolo obstetrician gynecologist who's leading uh, cancer, um, cervical cancer screening and prevention efforts in Malawi. He's, I think, the only Malawian citizen currently holding a research grant as contact PI from the NCI. He now sits on the guideline development group for the WHO in formulating guidelines, screening guidelines for HIV positive women for cervical cancer. This includes Shakina Elmore, who was recently recruited to our cancer center, um, largely because of her interest in working with our program in Malawi. She's the only black radiation oncologist at our cancer center currently. This includes Steve Kimani, who's a fellow who worked closely with me and it will soon be joining a faculty appointment uh, at the Huntsman Cancer Institute, becoming their only black medical oncologist. Um, so, you know, I do think that global health is attracting a diversity of thought to address, you know, cancer as an imminent public health threat uh, around the world. And that diversity of thought in some ways is what we're seeking in the broader cancer research community. So I don't want to trivialize this in saying that global health will solve all of our equity problems domestically, but I do think there's a strong thematic linkage that is worth mentioning, especially given the um, some of Dr. Tedros's comments is that I opened with. So with that, I wanna stop. Uh, I wanna just um, thank everyone for your attention, remind people that we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Act this year, as well as, as, well as the 10th anniversary of the Center for Global Health. Um, and that, you know, again, I think a lot of what we're doing reflects this principal pragmatism, optimism and reliance on science and evidence to guide the way that Drs. Tedros and Al Sadr and de Kock spoke about 10 years ago, the same year that the Center for Global Health was established at the NCI. I'll stop there. Thank you again. Delighted to hear your questions and comments. Well, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful talk um, that has generated, as you can imagine, a lot of interest. Um, uh, but before we get into the questions, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Ani Rusugi, who is actually the director of the Cancer Center here at Columbia University and also Interim Executive Vice President uh, and Dean of uh, Faculties of Health Sciences and Medicine here at, uh, at Columbia University. Um, there were some technical uh, difficulties at the beginning in having him join the webinar. So I'll hand it over to Anil, uh, to oh. you for- uh, Thank you so time. much, uh, Dr. Gopal. That was a brilliant and elegant uh, presentation. And I certainly, don't want to get in the way um, of the questions the, and, and the important discussion period. But to highlight here at uh, Columbia University in partnership with New York Presbyterian, 
that we really look forward to working with the NCI through this newly uh, constituted partnership inspired by uh, WAFA and ICAP and the rich history and tradition there with our cancer center. And we look forward uh, uh, to working with the NCI and others um, in terms of the globalization of cancer research and cancer care. So thank you for visiting us and Wafa, thank you for your leadership and, and that uh, we look forward to working very closely together with ICAP. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Anil. Very much appreciated. Thank you for all your support. Um, a couple of, a few questions um, uh, that have, um, that people have entered in the chat box. Uh, the first one is a question about, you know, does, is the NCI interested um, solely in uh, global cancer related issues that have relevance to the United States? Or is there also uh, interest as well in issues and projects that are um, of, um, of relevance to LMICs and that may not be very relevant to the United States. And how do you, you know, uh, where is the priority from uh, NCI's perspective? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, uh, without wanting to waffle too much, I think that, you know, we're interested in both. I think that there is a clear awareness. I think particularly with COVID and with some of the social justice movement that has occurred over the last year that many of our available tools have not been deployed equitably, including for populations in the United States, but also populations internationally. For example, human papillomavirus vaccination, effective cervical cancer screening. So I think there's a lot of interest um, in deploying those solutions so that they achieve you know, maximal impact. Um, with the Burkitt lymphoma example, though, you know, I tried to, I, I think, I don't, I think this is a somewhat false dichotomy. I think I truly believe that when you study cancer everywhere, it benefits people everywhere. And so I tried to highlight that with the Burkitt lymphoma example, which is that, you know, again, these children in Uganda really initiated decades of scientific discovery that um, have been remarkable. I think even within the, um, you know, going from first discovery of a new human tumor to cure of nearly all patients with that tumor is pretty remarkable over that period of time. But I do think we have to acknowledge that, um, you know, there's still opportunities to learn more and to um, develop treatments that could be translated back to some of the populations that have um, helped contribute to the, that important progress. Great, thank you. Uh, another question is uh, regarding, um, uh, you know, maybe let me rephrase the question, but people don't recognize that it's very hard to, um, to do, um, to sort of start a research project or do a research study de novo without there being already at least a platform of, um, of services on the ground, uh, sort of the fundamentals. And then, so um, more or less the need for having some service platform that's ongoing on which you can layer uh, the research on top of that. And, so um, what would you suggest in situations like in, you know, that many of the researchers face that uh, countries have really hardly any cancer related activities going on, uh, who wanna move things forward uh, uh, and do research, but on the other hand, it's not, there's nothing that supports at least the minimum of service delivery that's needed. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really important question, I, I think, you know, I might refer people back to some of your early uh, work and uh, in starting to catalyze this kind of progress for, for, um, for HIV. I think, I do think sometimes, again, I think people, it is possible to do both to some extent. That is, I, I think dichotomizing research and care delivery as two separate entities, I think is not always the right strategy. I think it's important to um, provide better service to people in the context of research studies. And I think it's also important to collect data that you can learn from in the context of caring for people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, uh, I tried to illustrate this a little bit. I think that's some of what we tried to do as we were initiating a program in Malawi without, you know, we tried to take advantage of existing HIV infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We tried to, you know, do things in a very stepwise and incremental way. We tried to ensure that we were delivering something of value to patients at the same time learning. Uh, lessons that would make, you know, would make care delivery better and that, you know, that, and that we could disseminate and report on and publish on and solicit grant funding with. Again, you have to, you know, there's a certain amount of that too that one needs to do in order to be successful. But um, I, 
you know, to the extent that you can merge these activities, I think, and do things in a fairly incremental and stepwise way, I think that's, that's again, I think that HIV scale up and even ICAP evolution over time offers a really nice example and precedent for that that people can borrow from. Thank you. Another question that um, uh, also, um, you know, is based on the, some of the data, the specific some of the data you showed from Malawi. And thank you again for sharing some of the lessons learned. It's very, very helpful. Um, and some of the data showed through, uh, that there was no direct association between CD4 cell count and some cancer risk. And the questioner was asking whether, um, was there an attempt to look at viral load, for example, could it be that um, viral load is more, is driving uh, the risk rather than CD4 in those contexts? For, yeah, so I, I mean, that is true for, so for example, in US studies, certainly viremia has an independent effect, HIV viremia has an independent effect on non-Hodgkin lymphoma risk, independent of the CD4 count. I think there are large uh, US cohort studies that have demonstrated that. I, I think that's likely true in Sub-Saharan Africa as well. Um, most of the viral load data that I showed you was EBV viral load, you know, related to EBV positive tumors. We, but we do have HIV viral load data as well. Um, mm -hmm. Typically patients were suppressed because again, ART scale up has been quite successful even in countries like Malawi through external donor funding and strong public health uh, systems. Great, thank you. And then maybe our, our, our last question is, is um, related to, um, uh, you know, there's some, um, you know, how do you see the balance between kind of research on prevention versus research on diagnosis and management of cancer? Yeah, that, that's a really good question that we're thinking quite a lot about. I mean, it, it is, um, it's estimated that in many low and middle income countries that, you know, up to 50% of cancers could be prevented through things like tobacco control or human papillomavirus vaccination. And, and so, and that's really important. Obviously, that's a really cost effective way of dealing with cancer. And I think reflecting that we certainly have programs that are focused on tobacco control. As many of you will be aware, a lot of the tobacco epidemic is shifting from high income countries to low LMICs as companies aggressively market to young people for example, in Africa, where smoking rates are generally quite low, but are increasing fairly rapidly. So there's a real opportunity to intervene and get ahead of that problem before it becomes a big issue. Um, so I think prevention research is important. Um, I think, you know, again, I think hearkening back to the early HIV days, um, you know, Wafa and Paul Farmer and others, I think made a very compelling argument. It's not right to just wait for a preventive solution. You also have to be willing to offer available treatment to patients who are suffering. And I think that's true for cancer as well. You know, I think in some ways uh, in the U US, we have a somewhat distorted view where we highly prioritize treatment research. And I think pre prevention research is somewhat underfunded. Many people would argue. And then internationally, I think there's often this assistant, there's this insistence that we can't treat cancer and that we should only prevent it. And I think we need probably a more balanced view in both domains. That is prevention is really important in the United States and treatment is really important in low and middle income countries. Um, so, uh, you know, again, dep depending on the economics of a specific country, they may have to prioritize certain interventions over others. But I think the idea that we would pursue only a treatment or only a prevention focused strategy in either place, I think doesn't make sense and is inconsistent with the way that we've approached HIV as a global public health problem and COVID for that matter, right? The WHO mm -hmm. programs focused on COVID have included vaccines, therapeutics, uh, PPE. It, you really need to take a more comprehensive view, I think, to have an effective global control strategy for any, any public health problem. Great. Well, I want to end by thanking you uh, for this uh, wonderful talk and for um, sharing with you your experiences and as well as also, of course, uh, the activities and the plans uh, from the perspective of the center that you lead at NCI. We very much appreciate you being with us today and appreciate all the, you know, the audience who joined us today. Uh, we do have several webinars just for the audience uh, upcoming. One is this Thursday, July 1 which is gonna focus on population surveys, measuring and informing the HIV response. 
and then um, another uh, um, another webinar on July 27th that's going to focus on differentiated service delivery and COVID-19. So thank you all for joining us and have a good day. Take care. And thank you. Thanks Dr. so much, everyone. Bye-bye.